Hey everybody, what's up? It's your boy MJ and welcome to Before the Poor, aka 20 Questions with MJ. My guest today is Ben Aniff. He is the managing partner of Tribeca Wine Merchants. Uh, Tribeca Wine Merchants was named one of America's best wine shops by Food and Wine Magazine. Uh, Ben's first job in the wine world was a part-time position at Tribeca Wine Merchants. He later went on to become the director of sales and has been the managing partner since 2014. Way to go, Ben. He has also been a leading figure in the fight against wine tariffs and was named a 2020 wine industry leader by Wine Business Monthly. He is on the board of directors of the National Association of Wine Retailers and is the president of the U.S. Wine Trade Alliance the all-tier advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring tariff-free environment for wines in the United States. And Ben lives in the Park Slope section of Brooklyn with his lovely wife, Hillary. Welcome, Ben. Is there anything else you'd like to add? You've got it, MJ. Great <laughs> to be here. <laughs> Glad to have you here. So to warm us up a bit, I'm going to ask you some not-so-personal questions, followed by James Lipton's famous 10 questions from inside the actor's studio. Uh, the key, just answer them quickly. First thing that comes to your head, just come off the top of your dome like we're, we're just spitting in a cipher in Washington Square Park, you know what I'm saying? And uh, meth is there. We're just kicking it. Q-tip's there. All right, so you ready to go? I guess there's no preparation involved here, which <laughs> makes me moderately uncomfortable, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is your favorite book? I love the Hamilton autobiography or biography right now. It would have been better as an autobiography, but the the Hamilton book right now I think is really fascinating. I know that's probably five, five years too late on that. Oh no, I I haven't I I can't get tickets. I think all and, of the all of know? the founding father uh, biographies, you know, Meacham, uh, all of those, you know, by Meacham and Company, Jefferson, George Washington, Hamilton, they're really fascinating, and particularly in a in a time frame like right right now when there's so much going on and there's so much thought about the way our country works and what works great about it and what works less great. Uh, I like going back and reading some of those books. For sure. I can see that. Totally. What is your favorite movie? Usual Suspects. Oh, that's a, that good a good I, one. Oh, come on. That's so good. That is so good. The first time you see it, it's so good. Maybe Groundhog Day is another one. I like movies you can put on in the background yeah. and just let go. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what scene you you start watching. You're like, oh, this is this is fabulous. I love it. Groundhog Day is another great one. Um, who's your favorite musical artist? Beethoven. Oh, wow. You are a classics guy. I love it. It's tough to beat Beethoven. I, I mean, they say if you're an orchestra person, like I was an orchestra person growing up, Beethoven makes everything better. I love you it. You start playing Beethoven, everything comes better. And it doesn't matter what kind of music you like. You should. It, it's worth. You know, it's one of the towering masterpieces of humanity, really. I mean, they had a disco song, the fifth of Beethoven. You're right. You just can't beat Beethoven. Beethoven did disco. He didn't even know he was going to do disco. My wife would also say I, I have a, a penchant for Roy Orbison, which she is opinionless on right now. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, what's your favorite food? Uh, death row, last meal, what are you having? Gosh, you know, that's a great question. I was talking about this with a buddy of mine the other day, and I, I don't think for me there's anything better than just great old school barbecue. Mm -hmm. I'm from Texas, and, you know, being in the food and wine world in New York, you know, you know the way it is. Yep. There's so much, there's so many incredible experiences you can have, um, and it, I don't know, last meal if I would choose to go, you know, a Landacos, the world's greatest wines, the most I extraordinary ingredients in food, or honestly, just a great old plate of barbecue from home. I mean, I think barbecue would have to do it for You'd me. have to go barbecue. You know I, what, I have to concur. You know what that has for me anyway? It has sentiment. Yeah. And sentiment is power. Yeah. I mean, it really is. Mm. God, I can't wait for the show to start. <laughs> um, who's your favorite athlete? Oh, Patrick Mahomes. I mean... It's oh, got to be. Yeah. I'm a Texas Tech guy. Uh, I feel like we'd be very close friends. Hopefully, he's going to listen to this podcast. Yeah, we got to uh, work. We got to hook that up. I yeah. actually think like a Winnebago tour with Patrick Mahomes and Lin Manuel Miranda and myself would be a lot of fun. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, go Chiefs. I love Mahomes. The kid knows how to win. Anyway, we we will talk after. We'll talk about the Super Bowl. They they. I'll tell you. You know where they screwed I, up, right? I, I, you I know where they screwed up, right? Try, try, they were down 13-7. They tried to score. Uh, they, they I just mean, they had the 12 offensive linemen yeah, out. Like, yeah. they were calling people yeah. out of the yeah. stands they, to play left tackle. You know, That's what happened. You know. Yeah. Um, 
All right. What was your favorite cartoon as a child? I mean, I was a Tom and Jerry guy. Like, you had to be a Tom and Jerry guy when I was growing up. Um, I, I've heard now I'm, it was an elder millennial. Now I heard a geriatric millennial, oh, born in 81. Stop. I don't know what that means. That mean, damn, uh, you know how old uh, that makes me? <laughs> but, you know, the Tom and Jerry. <laughs> how, old, how old? I don't know what they call me, Jurassic. <laughs> the, I like it. You know, the Tom and Jerry with, uh, there was also classic music in it, right? Yeah. So I love that. But yeah. the Tom and Jerry with Hungarian Rhapsody. Um, where I think, you know, the cat was trying to play it and the mouse is like banging his, you know, banging his fingers with the, with the hammers. It was great. Um, oh my God. Big favorite. So good. All right. Um, <clears throat> what was your favorite cereal? Cold cereal. Uh, I mean, on a luxury day, if I could convince my mom to get it, you know, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Easy. Nice. Um, but probably the best I could do on a normal week would be like Honey Nut Cheerios. Okay. Yeah, that's about right. That's most people like, if I could get sugar... It would be this, but most of us, it's so funny. Like, anyway, most of us, our parents did not, most of my guests did not have parents who were giving them Captain Crunch. That's all I'm going to say. I don't know what, and now we're in wine. So thanks, mom and dad. So I don't know. Exactly. Um, favorite comedian? Oh, Jerry Seinfeld. Mm. I mean, I'm from Texas. I moved to New York. Uh, my, the, my entire knowledge of New York stemmed from Jerry <laughs> Seinfeld. That's the reason I moved here. I didn't even understand there was something outside of the Upper West Side. I thought that was just another word for New York City. Wow. Um, but his straight stand-up was also a- incredible. And I have to say, my wife was great enough to get me tickets to see him uh, at the Beacon up on the west side, which was an amazing show. That's awesome. He's, 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 a, he's, a, he's a pro. He's really good. You can't go wrong with that. Okay. Um, who would you most like to have a bottle of wine with? Uh, living or dead, we got we got the uh, flux capacitor regenerated. We can bring anybody back. So, you know, I'd like to. I'd, I'd be interested in having a bottle of wine. I'm not sure that he drinks. I could possibly see him uh, being a teetotaler, but I, I should probably know better. Um, Dwight Eisenhower, I think, and I'm mm. I'm going to say Eisenhower because he he came he resided over a period of incredible transition for the United States. And he was incredibly thoughtful about it. You know, post-World War II, the U.S. was coming into its own as the legitimate world leader. You're walking through some of the, some of the most challenging time frames. You know, you're, you're watching the Soviet Union come to power, and people, people at that time think we, we could have World War III, you know, in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and I'd love to hear how he... Uh, approached some of those challenges, and uh, he was incredibly thoughtful about the way he, you know, the, the way he he lived his life and and thought about where the United States should go. And um, it's a challenging time. That's my off the cuff answer, by the way. Thanks for giving I, me I, absolutely I no notice in this. I know. Of course, I guess I I, I could have prepped, but I was I, I said yeah. To myself, I mean, I mean, you know what? I'm not going to prep. Yeah. I'm going to go in live. That, that's what this Let's is. Do it live. Listen, it's not this. <laughs> this is like bonus material. But I gotta tell you, that's a very thoughtful answer. Great movie called Why We Fight that was came out like in 2004, and it begins, the movie begins with Eisenhower's, uh, his last presidential address, where he w- told us where we were going to end up, which was at the military-industrial complex. Absolutely right. Very brilliant man. Well, you know, I don't know if you've seen Fog of War, uh, with the Errol Morris documentary with Robert McNamara. It is s- incredible. Got to watch it. Okay. But McNamara talks about, you know, he was Secretary of Defense during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he talks about how most military commanders at that point in the United States thought it was an almost certainty that we would have nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union, and we would have it soon. Yeah. And that the logical thing to do would be to get it over as quickly Strike as first. possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because the U.S. had a huge advantage over the Soviet Union at the time. And every year the Soviet Union was ca- catching up. And so it was, it was, you know, along the, that, same, that same transitional period yeah. where the, you know, and we were also getting used to these new weapons that could do destruction like we'd never seen before. Um, but I, I, I think Eisenhower particularly was, you know, thoughtful on that. But Errol Morris, uh, Fog of War, 
Robert McNamara. You've got to watch it. It's I incredible. I will check it out. I will check it out. Like okay. we could put it on right now. I, will, I definitely uh, like. To watch we can't, it. man. We got to do the show. Right. I know. I know. I know. You. I know you want to get out of it. He's like, I'm not prepared. He's trying to throw in a movie, but it's not happening, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to just run through these 10 questions in my James Lipton voice just for this part. Okay. Um, what's your favorite word? Staggering. Mm. What is your least favorite word? Dismay. That's a good one. What turns you on? Hope. And then what turns you off? Dismay. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Harmony. What sound or noise do you hate? Discord. What is your favorite curse word? Shit. <laughs> um, what profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? Hospitality, it's not really what I do. Yeah, got it. Um, what profession would you not like to do? Accounting. <laughs> and, and lastly, if heaven does exist, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Welcome, we're thrilled you're here. Ah. Good one. Well, Ben, that was fun. It was really insightful. And if you guys want more from Ben, and I know you do, make sure you tune in to our episode of the Black Wine Guy Experience. Until then, everybody, peace. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, MJ, and welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today is Ben Aniff, the managing partner of Tribeca Wine Merchants. Tribeca Wine Merchants was named one of America's best wine shops by Food & Wine Magazine. Ben's first job in the wine world was a part-time position at Tribeca Wine, where he later went on to become the director of sales and has been managing partner since 2014. Ben has been a leading figure in the fight against wine tariffs and was named a 2020 wine industry leader by Wine Business Monthly. He is on the board of directors of the National Association of Wine Retailers and is the president of the U.S. Wine Trade Alliance the all-tier advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring a tariff-free environment for wines in the United States. Uh, ben lives in Park Slope, Brooklyn, with his lovely wife, Hillary. Welcome, Ben. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Glad to be here, MJ. Thank you so much. Well, Ben, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, ben and I actually connected through uh, a soon-to-be podcast guest, uh, Josh Reynolds, said, you should have Ben Anif on. He'd be a great guest. So uh, I reached out to him. Or I, or I don't try to remember this. Time is fly. We were just sitting here going, it's, it's already, it's almost June. Like, so somehow we got connected through Josh. You said yes, and we're here, and I'm so excited you're here, man. Absolutely. Um, tell us what wines you brought, what we're going to be drinking this afternoon, a little day drinking Absolutely. Today. Uh, you know, I have two wines I, I'm really passionate about, and... Uh, one is a super fancy wine, and but isn't really a super fancy wine. And the other's uh, not. It really represents what wine's about. Um, the first wine I brought is a Dury Gentil Rui from 2018. And, you know, we're a Burgundy house, Tribeca Wine Merchants. It's what we do. We didn't start doing Burgundy four or five years ago. We've been doing it. It's been like <laughs> the premise of our business for a very long time. Um, and Rui is one of these outer lying appellations that, people just didn't care about for a long time. And I happen to think they're starting to be able to make some extraordinary wine. And, and there are a lot of, of uh, lesser known appellations where the ceiling is a lot higher than people realized. But not very many people had the capacity to sort of reach for that ceiling. Mm -hmm. And the, other, the next wine that I, that I brought, I think represents what that ceiling can be, could be. And it's a Dauvine, Ozy Duress, Le Clos, from 2007. So Domaine Loire's legendary uh, home domain, Dauvine. And Ozy de Rest, for most people, like Rui, um, is sort of an outer lying appellation that a lot of people haven't even heard of, mm -hmm. to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, while Rui's Cote de Chalonnais and Ozy's in the Cote de Bone, 
most people couldn't f- legitimately find where OZ is. And a lot of people simply don't know the wine, wines exist. But this represents to me what some of these less well-known villages can do. This wine could be, in my view, effectively any Chardonnay on the planet. Mm. If you have Montmarchais, Bateau Montmarchais, Creote, Marcel Perrier, Courtois Charlemagne, from the very best producers, the Dauvinay OZ bottling shows how incredibly high the ceiling is on some of these wines. And so I think I think it's a fun thing to do. I, I, that's one, one of the things we really like is finding, you know, what are the what are the parts of Burgundy particularly, but all over the world, where you can get really extraordinary wine uh, where the ceiling is very high, but maybe it hasn't been met yet. You know, we're sort of on that journey there right now. That's really cool because, <clears throat> I mean, with so much of the focus, um, I love what you said. You said, first of all, we didn't start doing Burgundy the th- last five years. And, you know, I think it's so good that there's this awareness coming to wine uh, because uh, we have like a whole, like athletes now are, are talking about consuming wine and, and so many of the NBA players love Burgundy, right? But Ron like, James walked into our Saturday tasting one day. And I tell you what, we're in Tribeca, so we, we get, you know the way New York is. Yeah, you yeah, see yeah, celebrities yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah. Nobody cares in New York. Nobody cares. Right. And, you know, we've gotten Meryl Streep, we've gotten loads of famous actors, and legitimately nobody blinks an eye. But on a Saturday afternoon, six foot ten LeBron James walks into the store, and everybody's like, oh, my <laughs> oh God. shit, it's LeBron. <laughs> and do you remember the Houston, uh, do you remember when he, he wore the Tom Brown, like, suit to the Houston Rockets? Yes. Uh, yeah. It was a famous, like, interview. Yeah, yeah. He wore, like, the short Tom yeah. Brown suit. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Spectacularly weird. Yeah. There, Tom Brown's like a block and a half from us, so I'm sure that's where he was. But uh, we had a, and a friend of ours poured him a Puri of Colin Marais, who loves the wines. But yes, yeah. we see that happening. Yeah, and so, so, and and so, a lot of it. I mean, Burgundy for the average consumer. We had an Eric Azemoff one for the average consumer. Burgundy is now out of reach. But for I think what you're talking about, like when you these outer lying villages that are lesser known. I think a lot of people go for the names in Burgundy, but I think there's so much potential, like you said, so I'm excited to try these wines, basically is what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. You know. Well, and you know, it's really hard today because, you know, if you think about, and I think about this a lot, like, what's the dollar value you're spending at, like, a great meal? If you're going to, like, a Michelin restaurant. If you're, if you're spend, if you're going to go to 11 Madison and you're going to spend 150 bucks a person, or gosh, it's probably more now. 250 bucks and it's going to be for vegetables. Soon. Oh my God, oh sir. that's God. a whole other conversation. Good Lord, uh, but but I always think you know if you're getting a two if you're getting a two star Michelin dining experience, I want to be able to have a two star Michelin wine experience for no more than the cost of that meal. Mm-hmm. And if your wine list can't do that, that that's a problem for me. If you're a three star Michelin and you're charging people three hundred bucks. To go, I want to see a three-star Michelin caliber wine priced at least in that range. And nowadays, these are some of the wines that are act- I actually think I would be totally satisfied with this Rui. And by the way, the wine's 40 bucks. It's not inexpensive, right, right. but it's mm-hmm. not over the top. But I'd be, com- I'd be thrilled with this wine at a, a load of really tremendous restaurants. That's awesome. So let's get a pour going, and then let's kind of, while, while you're pouring, like, so you are a... Uh, Texan. And God bless Texas. Yeah, and you, now you're a New Yorker. Uh, you went to Texas Tech um, and graduated with a bachelor's in music. I did. And and then you ended up, I guess, in New York State. You went to Ithaca to pursue your master's in music. That's right. Okay, so um, what was your goal when, when you were uh, an undergrad and even a grad student? Uh, you know, I went, when I was in high school in Texas, music is a thing, and like, Instrumental music is a big thing. Boy, yeah, the wine smells great. Oh, my God. It's just, you know, it's... That, I mean, for Rui. Yeah, I mean, uh, white... I mean, like, just that distinct and, nose of white burgundy. Like, you know, and there, there's just a nose. Like, everyone is different. But, like, you know when you stick your nose in a glass of white burgundy versus California. You know it. Well, you know what's funny <clears throat> is this is Cote de Chalonnaise, which half the people that drink white burgundy don't even know where the Cote de Chalonnaise is, which, you know, I'd completely mm-hmm. understand. But not a legendary village by any means. But if I was if I was going to a blind tasting and we were doing Chasson Montrachet and Pouligny Montrachet Premier Cruz, and I knew and someone said, "Hey, buddy, uh, you know my wine was corked. I accidentally brought just like a Rui from Dury Gentil, 
and there was some kind of prize for whoever bought the, the most delicious blind, mm -hmm. I would be concerned. Like, I would think, uh-oh, that Rui could embarrass my Chasson Marche. And, and yeah, that, and you should are... be. Yeah, no, no, you didn't. No, absolutely. This, I mean, oh. No, Rebecca Wine oh, Merchants, delicious. 40 um, miles a bottle. And, and by the way, get some. <laughs> oh, my God. If you, They've got this on the on the on the wine list at Crown Chai. Shy, the other I saw the other day at a very reasonable price point. Uh, I mean, I'd be thrilled with that bottle at a restaurant. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, uh, you know, I grew up as a musician, and you know, I I did classical music. I was a horn player, and you know, music's kind of this weird thing, especially classical music. And I remember when I was in undergrad, I went to, you know, there was one summer I got into the Aspen Music Festival, okay. and they call that like Juilliard West, and it's where everybody sort of goes, uh, you know, sort of preparation for orchestral training. And I had, uh, I'd always thought it'd be interesting to be a conductor, but no one in the world, you know, I, I, I think the job path is similar to being Superman, right? It's just, you know, <laughs> yada, 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 boom, you're Superman, and, or, or yada, 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 boom, you're a conductor. I didn't realize there was, a, there was sort of a path, but I got... Uh, I played for a couple of weeks in the Conductors Academy Orchestra at Aspen, um, which was fascinating because I got to see all of the student, you know, the grad school conductors um, practicing their craft. And I got to learn that, boy, really, it is a skill that, that you build and you learn. Um, and I thought that was fascinating. And so uh, there's this whole school of orchestral conductors that had come that had been wind people from the University of Michigan, and one of them was at Ithaca. And he said... Uh, I knew him through my uh, one of my college professors, and he said, "Look, uh, if you come, we're going to give you opportunities, and you're you're going to be in front of an orchestra every day. You're going to get to run a chamber ensemble. I, I got to run an organization where I, I got to work with Pulitzer Prize-winning composers. It was just it was amazing, and I had a terrific experience there. I got to do huge works, you know, Shostakovich Five, Beethoven Four, Brahms One, things that you you would never be able to do in most places." And then it's funny, I had a huge, uh, you know, I had a Job, what for me I thought was a Job moment, you know, a, 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 a real hardship. Mm -hmm. Right at the end of my, uh, a, a, of grad school, uh, and look, if, if you're in grad school for music, it's not like when you go get an MBA and they're like, here are all of the people that want to hire you. Right, right, uh, when right. you get when you go to graduate school in music, they're like, well, God bless, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, call us in 10 years and see if you've heard of a job. Uh, but I got a call from Cornell University and uh, they said they wanted me to uh, be a finalist for the associate director of bands at Cornell. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. First of all, I hadn't applied. Um, but th they knew I had previously been a wind player, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Boy, it's an actual job, right? Right out of right out of school, which is effectively impossible." Which mm -hmm. I understood, and so I did the, the smart thing, which is to put all my hopes and dreams and future on this one uh, this one thing. And I, of course, thought I did great in the interview because I'm tall, and tall people usually think they did great. Um, well, statistically, tall people do. I mean, they yeah, run, I mean, what they they run what studies. They I mean, they, do, like, they run studies. Taller people yeah. do. I mean, I could. I offered to like get any of the, like the music off the top shelf in the music <laughs> library. You know, like I could do thing. You know, stuff. Um, and anyway, I got a call a couple of weeks later, and they went with someone else, and I was just devastated. And uh. I mean, devastated. I was trying to notebook, you know, and think. Who has had more hardship in their life than me at this one moment, not getting the first job that I wanted? Um, <laughs> that you didn't even apply for. <laughs> at this, yeah. Um, and so I came to New York City, and I and I now, now look. The weird thing is, is it would have taken me like on a wind band path, which was total, not really what I wanted to do, but it, it was certainty. Mm -hmm. But I came to New York City, and I started working, um, doing exactly what I wanted, uh, working with you know regional orchestras. Um, Part time, which was fun. But you make zero dollars, and or not zero, but not enough to live in New York City. But New York City was so exciting. I mean, I mean you know, like the draw, the pull yeah, is yeah, incredible. Yeah. And I started working. You know, I needed. A, you know, most regional orchestras were heard. Maybe they got six concerts a year, right? So you do like a week. You know, a week's rehearsal and then a concert. Not enough to live on. Um, and so I'd thought about getting into, you know, lottery playing as a full-time profession to <laughs> sort of, you know, bridge the gap. And, I, and then I thought, oh, you know, maybe, that, maybe that's not, not going to pay the rent. Uh, so I saw an advertisement 
for you know a delivery guy at Tribeca Wine Merchants. So I said, God, you know, I really love wine, and I didn't. I knew nothing about wine, and when I say nothing, I mean I. When I said I loved wine, I mean that's basically the expand. The fact that I could recognize if what was in my glass was wine, I could tell the difference between that and beer or like a Jack and Coke. That was the expanse of my knowledge of wine at that point. Um, but I knew I really enjoyed it because you know Ithaca's in the Finger Lakes, and yep. so every yep. once in a while there would be some there'd be some uh, some bottles you know show up and they'd get consumed, and I thought that was just delicious and interesting. Yeah, and uh, I was very lucky. I. Uh, I had, you know, a 45-minute subway commute to work every day, and I just read. I've, you know, I, I think one of the great things that New York City offers is that built-in study hall called built called in study, <laughs> study hall. Exactly right. Subway, yeah. And so yeah. I had I had an hour and a half every day on the way to and from work to read. Uh, I, of course, like a lot of people, you know, got obsessed, and you were first starting to get, you know, internet forums that were sharing information. And I would read everything that I could, uh, and I was in a place that gave me access to really, really great wine. And and to to people, you know, you could walk around Tribeca, and you know, Daniel Jonas's office were a couple of blocks away. He would pop in. Uh, you know, we had Boulet next door. Uh, we'd see the wine drinkers there. Tribeca Grill around the corner. It, it's this in incredible little wine community right over there that, that's been there for a long time. Um, you know, and, and sort of the heart of Burgundy, right? If you think da when Daniel jo Jonas and uh, Drew Nieperon opened Montrachet, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was the heart of Burgundy in the United States. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew the wines. Nobody cared, really. Um, but it, so it was, I, I was given access at, to, to knowledge that would have been really hard for me to replicate in other places. Totally. How many, uh, before, uh, before we move on to music, how many instruments do you actually play? Or did you used to play? Uh, I mean, I I could could have played. How many instruments I'd feel comfortable playing in like an orchestral setting? One. Okay. How many <laughs> instruments could I play a scale on? A lot. Um, but I, I I don't know that I would say I can play them. I can tell you, and for all of the for anybody out there, if you're if you have if you're a list person, you know, if you like the you know the Atul Gawande checklist book or whatnot, Check Man Manifesto, which is great, or if you just like. If you're a classic American and you like to list the best ofs, that's a very mm -hmm. American thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, hardest tasks. I think that's an interesting one. Or hardest jobs. Those okay. sort of things. I would tell you that the hardest task that I have ever had to do was to play a chromatic scale on a bassoon. Um, it Most instruments have some sort of logic assigned to them. You know, like you push first button, second button, third button, which is followed by fourth <laughs> and then you switch hands, you go first, second, third, fourth. Uh, the bassoon is derived, from what my understanding, mainly through witchcraft. Uh, <laughs> and effectively, it's like there's 75 buttons, some of which you would half cover, full cover, and every single note going from low to high, it's effectively a brand new combination that has absolutely no relationship whatsoever with the previous note. So it is the hardest task that I've ever had to do, and the most... Probably the most stressful thing that I've that I've had to live with was my midterm bassoon final in undergrad. And and what is the instrument you feel most comfortable? If you were in an orchestra, what would you like? If you went I was a French horn player. French horn. Beautiful. Now you're supposed to just call it the horn. Oh. The International Horn Society has told us. Oh my God, I can't do Corno, it. Corno, yeah. I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, okay. Weirdly enough, we're the only people that call it the French horn. The French are like, what are you talking about? It's, just, it's, it's the horn. <laughs> yeah, they don't call them French frites either, you know, so we do a lot of yeah, things. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, all right, so you started at the bottom. He's like, oh, wine delivery. So you, -ah. you know, so you become a wine delivery person. You are studying on the subway. What were some of the, the books you were reading? What were some of the things you were consuming? To McNeil's Wine Bible was the first book I read cover to cover, and I thought that was, you know, if you want to get into the wine world, I think that's really helpful. It gives you, you know, not a ton of, uh, it doesn't go incredibly deep in every part of the wine business or part of the wine world, but it's but it's very very broad. You need to, you need to learn the very basics about almost every region, and they give you, you know, a good, better, best producers in every region. And then I remember uh, Jay, McInerney, Jay McInerney's uh, Hedonist in the Cellar, which I thought was just fascinating. You know, 
Jay writes book, really great books are about wine, but they're not technical. You know, he'll compare yeah. something to a movie or an actress, uh, and it's very visual. And by the way, another terrific, you know, Tribeca connection, you know, Bright Lights Big City with Odeon on mm -hmm. the front cover, mm -hmm. you know, which is effectively a block from our store. But um, it, it it was just, that, one, that book made me really, I didn't know anything about what these wines were. You know, I, I remember reading about, you know, there's an article about uh, Danny Meyer loving Cintarelli. And mm -hmm. I didn't know who Danny Meyer was, and I didn't know what Cintarelli was. <laughs> but I wanted, to, I wanted to learn about both. Uh, and he made, he made you really, uh, it wasn't just that the wines were interesting or delicious, but that they, they gave you an experience mm -hmm. that you might not have in another way. Yeah, totally, totally. Wow. I just, when you said Quinter, Quinterelli, I mean, I think I'm, I, like, I've had it a few times, and it is, I was like, my mind just went there. I was like, oh, it is a total experience, like you said. It's oh, a, absolutely. Just, oh. Um, so how long did you stay in delivery? What was your next steps? What's the progression? You, you, you're, you're, you're reading, you're studying. I'm sure, I assume they let you taste uh, at the store. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was, I was uh, the good news about, Tribeca Wine Merchants is, you know, we, we do work with the wines we were really interested in, our, the, the sort of premise, which I, I won't say it's the right premise, but it's what we've always sort of believed. You know, we, we love like the, we love wines of terroir mm -hmm. um, that, that reflect place mm -hmm. and that reflect varietal really well. And uh, for us, that means, you know, we do a lot of the, mostly the old school wines. It was mm -hmm. um, Burgundy and Piedmont and Older Bar Barolo. Uh, Daniel Jonas actually said it really well to me one time. The best way to learn about those wines, you want to learn about the wines of Domaine Lefleve. Like, what are all the different Premier crews that Lefleve makes? Pick them up and put them back down. When you got to move twenty cases of Domaine Lefleve up and down, <laughs> up and down a flight of stairs, then you really start to learn the wines. Uh, and I, I still think that's one of the best ways to learn about wine. Go pack boxes. Go move boxes. Uh, do inventory, um, and it's hard. It's hard to do that from a, It's hard to do that from an office, or you've really got to, you know, put your hand on the thing, and it really helps you learn it. But um, pe people saw that I was, you know, obsessed. And look, mm -hmm. wine's a lot like music, right? You yeah. basically you found a hobby. You you have been uh, something's taken a hold of you. You know, people that want to get into music, they're they're not getting into music because their parents always wanted them to get get into music. Uh, they're getting into music because they think this this is it's this incredible thing, and it would be such a luxury to be able to spend your time doing what you love. Mm -hmm. Wine is very similar to me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, and particularly the fine and rare wine world, no one would get into that business because they think that's the that's certainly not the biggest market in the wine world. You, you, a, a business would make a lot more money probably selling millions of cases of Pinot Grigio. Yep. Um, but you have to be really passionate about it. And they saw that I was really passionate about it, and they gave me opportunity. And I, I, I'm complete, I recognize completely that, particularly in, in, in my niche, mm -hmm. uh, that I you know, sort of fell into this sort of you know, fine wine niche, um, it's hard to find opportunity. And I, I wouldn't be where I am without it. But I, I remember specifically, for instance, you know, we often had uh, great Burgundy and Bordeaux that would get opened at, uh, you know, customer would come in or there'd be a little wine dinner that somehow I'd, I'd get a glass of before people went out. But I, I didn't really feel like I understood the wines of Piedmont very well. Mm -hmm. um, I'd read a lot about them, and I'd heard how extraordinary they were. Um, and I remember I told, uh, you know, the partners at the time, I said, God, you know, I feel like I've learned so much. Like, I'd, at that point, I'd have, like, I like to say the Domaine Lefebvre because it's a good example. I felt like I'd had every Domaine Lefebvre wine except for Montmartre. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was really fascinated by them. The, it was the 04 vintage, which was rough for red, but really great for white. And the wines, by the way, cost nowhere near what they cost today. Um, shocking no one. But I said, I, I really, I, you know, I read it's supposed to smell like violet and tar and, you know, fruit, but I, I don't even know what that means. Um, and one of the partners said, gosh, you know what, there's a dinner that we're going to, and uh, we actually had somebody cancel. Why don't you come to dinner? And 11 Madison was doing these really interesting wine dinners. And at that time, and that night, or later that week, there was actually a Piedmont dinner, and I was actually at a table with Roberto Conterno, wow. um, with some really knowledgeable old collectors, uh, 
people that had been doing, you know, Caterno Monfortino and the wines of Giacosa and Bartolo Mascarello for a very long time, for 30 years, when absolutely nobody cared about those wines. They were buying them. Um, and it was fascinating. And it was, you know, my very first and some of my most memorable experiences of those wines because they are so entirely different from, uh, you know, the, the, there's obviously a lot of overlap between those wines in Burgundy, but they're also entirely different. The mm -hmm. flavor profile is very different. Um, but they do represent you know, what we like about wine, what's so interesting is the singularity of, uh, you know, the way terroir and grape uh, can work together to show something incredibly unique and delicious. And so both of those aspect things with Burgundy and, Bar and Piedmont are very, very similar, obviously. It's a wine of place, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. it's transparent, it's a wine of single varietal, um, but the profiles can be very different as, as well. So, but, but it's fascinating. But I, I'm really cognizant that uh, there are not a lot of places I would have had the opportunity to do that. And it's a really difficult thing to get experience with and to learn. It, it really is. So I, I feel very fortunate in that respect. You know, I, 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 uh, I, I understand it completely. You know, had I, you know, working at Acker, you know, a, another fine wine exactly shop right. gave me access to things that I, that I would just never have had the opportunity to taste. And, 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 and that was just really, that's just, that was just luck, you know, that was. Right. Exactly. Exactly right. Um, but, but it is very true. Um, it, 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 there's just not a lot of places you can have these opportunity to taste these wines. And um, it's getting more difficult. And, 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 and exactly. Really and, and getting way more difficult. Like I said, I mean, it was, yeah. Um, so, uh, you're geeking out, man. You're studying. Well, the wine's delicious. It's, right now, oh, isn't it? it's so good. It's, it's so good. I tell you, we need you. Uh, we posted. You're gonna wish you had Tastegram instead of Instagram because these wines are just. Mm. Um, so, then you get on the floor. You uh, you know selling wine. Uh, what was that experience like for you? Like, did you feel like you said earlier, like with the music? You know, you like, you know, I, you know, it's like yada yada boom. So like, were you when you when you first went out to sell wine? Were you feeling confident? Or you how were you feeling? Well, my very first days, I remember I was utterly terrified because I didn't know what a Sangiovese tastes like. Yeah. Um, someone would come in and say, you know the way, wine descriptors are difficult, right? Yep. They're difficult if you've been in the wine business for a very mm -hmm. long time. Right. When someone says, I want something sweet or not sweet, it might mean something totally different to someone. <laughs> exactly. You know, one person might think a Chardonnay is sweet, whereas another person might say, well, actually, there's really no sugar, residual sugar in this wine, so it's dry. Um, so that was baffling to me. Uh, but I had a couple of people that, you know, gave me the, you know, the, f you know, the first week of wine sales, uh, look, this is, this is a great Chianti, you know, at the time Malbec was really big, you know, this is the difference between Malbec and a, a California Cabernet, um, you know, here's a, here's a great little Pinot Noir that people mm -hmm. are going to really love, but starting to do the fine and the, the fine wine stuff, it, um, by the time, by the time I was allowed to do that stuff, I was just ready to go. Um, I, I'd read way more than I had any, any business really reading. Um, so, you know, there was sort of an imbalance in like, you know, how much I thought I knew about the wine versus <laughs> like my experience tasting the wines. Right, right. And that's one of the things also that you start to realize with these, you know, with, with really knowledgeable collectors um, is, is they get so much of this experience. That they're some of the most knowledgeable people out there. 100%. Um, and I, w one of the things that I, I have to say that I really love love about the wine business um, that was different than the music business. Um, in the music world, and even though my career was short in the music world, I lived in the music world for a long time, right? And if you're at a table with musicians, uh, if you're not a musician, it's going to be rough, mm -hmm. probably. I mean, unless you're just obsessed with that, with, with the minutia of whatever mm -hmm. those musicians do, because that's going to be the topic of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And most of the people that do it, they're hyper-knowledgeable, um, but very focused. Um, there's not a lot of breadth. It's the opposite of a Renaissance man, right? They, <laughs> you know, they have one skill that they've been perfecting for a very, very long time, and, and that's typically what you know. Conversation revolves within two or three degrees of that. Mm -hmm. So it's tough when you bring a girlfriend who's not a musician mm -hmm, or a buddy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but the wine world, I think, is so fascinating and it's so great because people really come together because they are from a wide uh, a wide field of, uh, of of vocations and professions and this is the thing that brings them all together yep. you know you have people from from, from every walk uh, 
and wine is the thing that they're most passionate about. And in the fine wine world, obviously, you get a lot of really brilliant people. And they have interesting stories that are fascinating, that are different from one to another. And this is the thing for, for many of them that they are, they're just so fascinated with. This is, it, it brings them their joy. And then there's a very old school, um, you know, you, if you want to get to know somebody, break bread with them. Yep. Yep. And 100%. that's the positive that wine brings is it builds community, mm -hmm. you know. And it's really easy, I think, in our world to become, especially the fine wine world. I mean, you worked at Acker. It could be really easy to get jaded and to be like, I'm really adding no value to the planet. Mm -hmm. I am selling. Uh, now, It's the wines are very expensive. So so if you wanted to be jaded, you can say, I'm, I'm selling incredibly expensive wine to a very limited number of people. And there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, we want to try to help, br you know, expand the number of wines on the lower end. But if you want to say that and you're like, I'm looking at a spreadsheet and this stuff's just, I'm just selling expensive wine to rich people, you can be jaded that way. But when you s pop a cork and share wine with someone and you really see how, how quickly wine builds community, mm -hmm. and these people that are passionate about wine – they, they really want that community there, too. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I almost think, you know, half the product here is community. Mm -hmm. And you breaking bread together for, you know, for people that have, you know, a wide array of different opinions and different voices, um, that is a huge positive. And there aren't very, t to my knowledge, outside of, like, the wine world, I don't know anything else where you get people from such a wide array of uh, of, of Play, their places in life where you, you that where, where people really are being brought together like this, um, and it gives people a point of commonality, um, and really builds relationships. It's it's pretty incredible, I think. Now you you hit on a very mm, poignant topic there. Like it is this it is this beverage that brings us together, where we can you, you know, and you can come from all different walks of life, and you can have different everything you just said. But you know what? We can agree this is a good bottle of wine. We start talking about that bottle of wine, and, and it facilitates conversations that might never happen. Absolutely otherwise. right. And and the community is such a part of it. I mean, I, I agree with that. I think I said if more people would get together, have a meal, drink some wine, um, we'd we'd have a different we'd have a different world if more people would uh, could come together and do that. Well, we're so isolated today. Typically, I mean, it, it, you you may most people probably don't don't get together and have a great conversation with someone who believes something very different than they do. And wine's something that really, I, I mean, I, I don't want to get too, uh, you know, philosophical here, but it, it really is one of the very best community builders I know. And, and I think that goes back for a, a very long time, thousands of years. If you want to get to know your neighbor, break bread. Yep. Yep. I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I agree and we can get philosophical, but I agree. I mean, like literally, uh, you know, in the, especially in the fine wine world, like you will sit down with people who you could have very different opinions from. But if you are you talking about the wine and there's just a way that you come to see what you agree on instead of what you disagree on. Absolutely right. You, you know, you don't want to look at people that have a difference of a, a point of view as you as the others. Right. And wine is a way where you can build community with people that you uh, – that will let you see them as you, you can see people's humanity in a different way. I mean, right? They go. We're not saving the planet here, but 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 it, it's a, it is a legitimate thing to break bread and share share a, a great glass with someone. I think. Yeah, you go. He can't be all that bad. He likes this wine. That's no, exactly. Really, right. That's really hey, what you said yourself. At least there's one thing <laughs> we can exactly, agree on, man. Right? Come on. Exactly. <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, you know what? Hang on. We're gonna take a quick break, and then we'll be back with more Ben. So uh, hold that thought. We're gonna get into some more stuff with Ben. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back. So we were just getting all philosophical about how wine brings people together, and then you know, and then I hear my mother, who, who, who my mother's voice saying, "That's right." You know, what did Jesus say? Break bread, and, and what did he do? He turned water into wine. I mean, it, first it, miracle. It, it, it's 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 <laughs> save the best for last. Yeah, it's come on. Uh, I'm just saying. Um, so <clears throat> let's talk about. Your journey from sales director to managing director. I mean, this is like quite, you've had, you had quite uh, an ascent there, you know? Well, I mean, I'm tall, so I always started out high. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, 
<laughs> you know, I, I think uh, I loved Trevica Wine Merchants. I'd had a lot of, you know, incredible experiences there. And uh, there was a point where uh, it was just sort of inev inevitable I, I was going to become a partner if uh, – or I was probably going to do my own thing or, or become a partner at one point. And luckily, you know, we found a way that it made sense for me to, to for me to stay on and become the managing partner. And it's it's a, a, a something I feel very blessed with. It's you know I feel very fortunate. Um, there are a lot of really brilliant, talented people, knowledgeable people in the wine business. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of people that could do my, do my job that maybe didn't have the experiences that that I had. Uh, I mean, I. I'm a musician, so like a, as a kid, I think you know any skill I built, you know, was there was a path involved in that, right? Mm -hmm. And Tribeca Wine Merchants gave me a path that let me build my skill sets in a way that a lot of people probably could have, um, but they didn't have the opportunity. So I, I was very thankful for that. And it's just it really is a lovely community. And I, also, I have to just say, Tribeca is a ama an amazing place. Mm -hmm. um, we opened June uh, right before 9/11, and. Uh, the community still feels um, nobody moves. It feels, you know, in, in a place like New York City where it's incredibly easy to feel uh, jaded or alone or that you're not a part. Um, you know, nobody knows who lives, you know, who's in your building. Nobody knows you. There, there's, there's new tenants every <laughs> The Seinfeld every episode minutes, where Kramer's months. got them wearing yeah, the day exactly tag, right. so you they know. know each other, yeah, right. People are moving constantly. <laughs> you know, in Tribeca, it is a real community. I, I, I mean... You, I, I walk to the deli. People wave in the street. I mean, it's it's as close to you know where was Andy Griffith, the sheriff of Mayberry. Mayberry. It's yeah. as close yeah. to Mayberry as like I could imagine uh, you know New York City being. <laughs> and, you know, and right. e even though it's you know it, it's a very wealthy neighborhood, it's not people. People live in Tribeca because they don't want all of the services and the who's what's it's you know it's a great school district so people want to want that but it, it feels uh it feels different than what like a stereotypical view of i don't know like park avenue would mm -hmm. feel you right, know right. I, i've never worked up there i don't really know it very well but um at the very least it true it's, it's true that it seems like it could be different um people in tribeca really treat one another very well there's a real sense of of warmth and community people i, I tell you what um People coming back into the store now, toward, you know, we're right here towards the knock on wood, hopefully the end of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, we had a wine tasting, a small wine tasting in the store the other day, and I can't tell you how, how thrilled people were. And it's people we know. Um, it, you know, it's not, you know, the neighborhood itself is not the uh, primary focus of the business. It, you know, it's a small neighborhood. People move or, or, or people are are away a lot. It, it, it's slow. Uh, you know, if walking through Tribeca doesn't feel like walking through New York City, right? There's not a million people on the streets. Every, all the apartments are huge, so not a ton of people live there. Mm -hmm. um, and and we've always, you know, sort of, you know, look, we sell great wine all over all over the country, all, all over the world. But the neighborhood itself feels incredible. I mean, it really it, it feels very lucky to be a part of of that place. Um, the neighborhood went through a lot after 9-11 and there's there's a and then also by the way after the financial crisis mm -hmm. i mean city groups very close to us you know there's a, there's a lot of financial services companies right around there a lot of people work in that industry and they went through hell and, and what know, about uh sandy did was there flooding down absolutely there? Yeah, i mean we were lucky that it didn't quite reach to us but okay. there were a couple of buildings on the edge that, mm -hmm. that got that got hit but there, there's a, a real feeling of community there, and uh, that I don't know that you have that in every in every neighborhood. You know, people go to Tribeca, and they want to stay. They want to live there. They, it's it's an amazing place. So let's talk a little bit about <clears throat> some of the what would you say are some of the similarities between wine and music, particularly like uh, classical orchestral music that you were into. Well, I mean, there's there there is a lot. If I put the nail you know if I'd hit the nail on the head I think probably they both bring intellectual and hedonistic pleasure uh, okay I mean Beethoven is both incredibly joyous to live to listen to you know Copeland is incredible you know brings me so much joy and happiness but they're also they also hit all of the intellectual buttons I mean they are just fascinating and they are 
towering works of humanity. I mean, the, the great works of music are some of the very finest things that I think you know humans have have done have have done on this earth that are responsible for, and and wine can be that similar uh, hedonistic pleasure and intel that also hits all of these sort of intellectual buttons. Um, you know, look, if it's just about pleasure, you know, I love diet, I love a, a diet Dr. Pepper and a plate of barbecue, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's just pure outright hedonism. Um, I don't know how much more there is to unwind, right? You get it all on the first bite. I mean, heck, you can just walk into the restaurant and you're like, yeah. oh, man, this, I know exactly what I'm yeah. getting here. Yeah. Whereas, you know, watching a wine develop over years or develop over time, I mean, if you've got six bottles of a great bottle of a great wine, um, Watching what happens to that wine over 20 years is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Watching mm -hmm. what happens to, to a bottle over the course of several hours can be really mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention, you know, we, the, the fact that, you know, I mean, even, even take Chardonnay, how incredibly different it can be made in a pretty close to the same way from one vineyard to another vineyard that's 100 yards away. And mm -hmm. we really have no answer why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't have a lot of understanding there. there. There's a lot of magic that happens in in winemaking and, and in the wine world. Uh, you know, why is it that one vineyard is, you, you know, displays a given, a given set of characteristics and then 100 yards away it, it may, the same grape varietal made exactly the same way by the same person with the same yields might show something very different. And that's just fascinating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not to mention, it's always changing. Mm -hmm. You have new wine producers that are, that are coming in. You have new uh, appellations that are being treated in different ways. You have changes in generation. So if you if you like something that isn't static, if you want to always have to be learning, wine is that. Yeah. Because if your knowledge yep. of wine is, uh, you know, Sherry Lehman circa 1997, it is very very different than today. <laughs> um, it, 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 and and that that's fascinating to me. I love that. Speaking of fascinating, I, I poured some of this 07, and then my producer just saw my face. My I just make like. Ooh. Like a fuck face or something, like, oh, like just faces just all scrunched up. Just you know what I mean. Like my toes just curled. Um, yeah, I'm gonna pour a little here. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, more than a little bit. Yeah, that's you brought it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, just again, it's a white burgundy, but it's got some age on it, and just the nuttiness, the the waxiness, the the intensity. You, with Dovene, you get an intensity that you get with only a handful of other white wines on the planet. Um, I mean, this is Ozy de Ress. So it, it's Le Clou, so it's a little Ludi, but a village Ozy. It's basically our front yard at Dovene. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a humble appellation. You know, I, I think fr it's a great story. You know, like Francois Frere, like, brings her uh, groceries, you know. Oh, no, tell the story, please, because I'm uh, sure I got listeners at all levels, but I'm, there's so... <laughs> Even like intermediate people probably don't know like these great stories. I, would, yeah. I, I mean, domain, you know, Lalubi's Loire, you yep. know, for a lot of people, I think, for me, um, is maybe the, I don't know if you can call her winemaker, you know, magician or uh, she, she, she's a force like no other. And she impacts her wines in a way that I, I don't know. A wine know. wizard, I'm trying she's to She's a wine wizard. Oh, yeah. that's probably the best yeah. way to say it. She's a, She is a wine wizard. And, and you don't understand what's happening, but... You know, this is her home domain, uh, Dovene. She's obviously also in charge of, you know, Domaine Loire, and then she's the co-owner of Domaine de la Romaniconti. And the Domaine Loire wines are absolutely extraordinary. Um, but there's something really special about Dovene. And what I love about this is this is really her, you know, Dovene is an Ozy de Ress, which is, you know, a little outerlying appellation sort of on the other side of Merceau. But okay. it's not in, it's not where you think, the great white burgundies are Chasse Marche, Pouligny Marche, Merceau, maybe Courtin for Courtin Charmaine. Um, this is, you know, if you're driving the, you know, the route de Van, you're not even gonna, you're not even gonna see Ozzy, right? Um, and for most most people, Ozzy's a, you know, thirty dollar bottle of, bottle of white burgundy that, you know, they may they're not quite sure how to pronounce it. I think I'm pronouncing it right. Oxy, I'm, I'm a uh, oxy duress. You know I say it the way I say it. That's the way I can say <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, um, but. Um, this wine, for me, even though it's this very humble outer lying appellation, uh, there really are only, I don't know, three or four wines that, white wines from Burgundy, I think that can be this extraordinary. And they're all, uh, you know, it's DRC Montrachet, 
Coach Corton Charlemagne, Coach Marisol Perrier, um, maybe some wines, you, you know, some tippy top wines from a couple of other mm-hmm. producers, mm-hmm. but always the top pinnacle appellations. And this is Ozzy. This is Ozzy Dress. If you know, I I use the blind, you know, uh, anecdote a lot. If you you know, if you had five people going to a restaurant and uh, it was exp- an expensive meal, and you said, you know what? How about whoever wins the blind pays for dinner? Or, or, or uh, everybody else has to pay for dinner, and uh, you know, the guy who wins the blind doesn't. It's going to be really expensive. If I saw, and I brought a DRC Montrachet, mm-hmm. and I saw someone else had a Dauvinet Ozzy Duress, and it was going to be blind, I would be really nervous. Right. <laughs> I would be really nervous that their Ozzy might beat my DRC Montrachet, because I guarantee it can in a given vintage. Not every year. Mm-hmm. And, but moreover, the fact that you can pour that thing blind next to it and, and, and even come close to approaching it right. is extraordinary. And I, th- I think it sort of shows what the ceiling is on some of these outer line, some of these villages that we used to not really take that seriously. I mean, part of the fate of these villages was sort of self-determined. You know, it's a chicken and the egg scenario. What happened? You know, did they not plant... Did they, did they not pay the most attention to their vineyards or use low yields because they were in a non-famous appellation and so they weren't going to get much money? Or did they not get much money because they weren't making <laughs> doing great yields? Um, this kind of this wine shows, I, I think, what can happen when you give top-notch, you know, sort of pinnacle-level winemaking and and uh, wine farming to some of these other a- appellations. And you know, people like Durijantial, I think. And Rui are, uh, and I'd say like Bruno, like Lorenzon and Mercure. Those are people that are seeing what La Lubie's Loa does and says, wow, um, we might be able to do something special. And you know, it's actually funny. I, I poured this, this Rui at my wedding, the 2014, okay. uh, at my wedding. And, and it was one of my favorite. I just absolutely love the wine. And then I was actually on a visit with Domaine, at Domaine Loa. And uh, Gilles, who is the you know, president or some who's he what's it at Domaine Loire. Really nice guy. Uh, has been in the store before, so I sort of knew him. And I, and I was early. Um, the importer, who's a good good buddy of mine, was running late. and was like, hey, Ben, can you run over there? Because, you know, Gilles is going to be waiting for us. So I ran over, and we were, you know, just chatting. And, uh, you know, Gilles, uh, you know, I, I'm, of course, incredibly excited to taste the new vintage of Domaine Loire. <laughs> uh, and Gilles, you know, we're, we're chatting. He's like, hey, do you know Dury Jean all? And I was just like, what? And I was thrilled because I got to say, oh, my God, I do know Jean yeah, Dury yeah. Jean I poured it at my wedding. And he goes, oh, my God, there's some of my very favorite wines. And then you come to find uh, there's a great co- quote where Jean-Francois Coche de Rie talks about how anytime he's on a, on a, at a restaurant in Burgundy, if he sees Dury Jean on the menu, he's buying it. I mean – don't so, you love that? I like, love that. Like, like, like a winemaker's wine. Like a, absolutely. Yeah, like, like, I love winemakers' wines. You know, I, that's absolutely. Th- those are the gems. Like, and and, and in Burgundy, I think it's especially um, <clears throat> uh, really telling because there's just the cost of Burgundy has skyrocketed, right? So, and these people, like, like I'm, the producers, they have their own stash of wine, of course. But for them to go out and be like, oh no, I'm drinking that. That's when you know. Like, I had me oh, like so a huge cool. validation for you when he said, "Do you know this wine?" Oh, like, and I got to feel, I, I got to, it made me feel like I knew something. I was like, <laughs> wow, I, I, I actually do know this wine. I was so thrilled. But yeah, I mean, you know, people, if you store wine at any pro, at any price point, right? Like if you're buying a case of wine because you want to, you want to, you know, put it away and see what happens, you're really doing that for hope, right? Right. You, th- you hope and you think something yep. Yep. really incredible might happen. If you, if you wanted it for certainty, you'd do something else, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're bringing the unknown in, right? You don't know what's going to happen in 10 years. Whereas if I taste this today, if I taste this New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc today and say, okay, I'm going to buy that exactly exact same bottle. It's under screw cap. I'm going to take it home. It's going to taste really close to exactly the same. But you're, you're buying a case of wine. You're going to put it away for a little while. It's because you think there might be something more. There might be something unknown you haven't reached yet. And uh, when people do that... It's the ceiling that matters, right? Like, how high could this thing go? How interesting could this thing go? And I think for a long time, people didn't, they didn't really treat a lot of these sort of lesser known places very seriously Mm -hmm. because they didn't think the the ceiling was very high. 
but the ceiling probably wasn't very high because most of the winemakers, um, I mean, look, they're they're trying to feed their families, and that yep. usually meant we need to make more wine on our three hectare, not less wine, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But that also impacts the the quality of the wine. There's no doubt, and there wasn't there wasn't it wasn't necessarily clear you were going to get more money if you say, I, you know what, I'm going to make half the production. Really, you'll lower my yields, but the wine's going to be way better. It, you didn't really know you were going to be able to pay for that. I mean, what was your wife going to say? Oh, we're making half the wine. Are we going to get more money for it? Or are you just telling me that I can't <laughs> buy groceries next week? Um, but I think, you know, this bottle from Dovenet and some of the others, are they're showing what can how incredibly high the ceiling can be. And they're, look, with climate change, too, by the way, we're going to yep. have to start looking around. Yep. We don't necessarily know what's going on. Right. You know, we've got this window right now that we're sort of in transition. But I, I remember it, I was doing a visit at Domaine Le Fleuve a, couple, a few years ago, and, you know, there had been some... Primox problems with with Domaine Le Fleuve and uh, that were that have been concerning and I asked them what their opinion of it was you know what were some of the causes that they thought and they talked about like the different the different harvest times and, and Le Fleuve is very old um, but they had gone something like a hundred years without harvesting in August like it was some incredible time frame mm-hmm. where their vineyards had not been harvested in the month of August and because of climate change starting in the very, very late 90s, you know, they had one vintage that was done in August. And then it was like seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It, 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 it's incredible uh, the way climate change is impacting a lot of our favorite wine regions. And look, uh, wherever you were, especially in the, old, in the old world, you know, these are really northerly Appalachians, right? Like Bordeaux is, Bordeaux is really one of the more southern uh, famous wine regions in France, right? That's mm-hmm. the latitude of Minneapolis, St. Paul, <laughs> right? Good so I, I mean, we're talking north, <laughs> and we think of oh, well, that that's Cabernet country, you know, the, it, it, the terroir is hot there. No, 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 no. Um, and so all you know, all the best sites, and particularly if you think Piedmont, if you think um, in the Mosul River Valley, if, if you think uh, you know Burgundy, certainly, you know, uh, some some in Champagne as well. A lot of the most famous vineyard sites. Um, we're all southerly facing, southerly facing, mm-hmm. you know, or it was w- wines where you got the most sun, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. vineyards where you got the most sun, and I, I don't know that that's necessarily made true going forward. I mean, in Piedmont, they're having loads of discussions about changing some of the Appalachians. Um, they're they're all they're gonna you know in Piedmont they're also talking about maybe maybe one day we're gonna need to irrigate. I mean that's like sacrilegious stuff, but it's all also means that um, they're gonna be places that didn't necessarily make world class wine or hadn't yet that. Might start. Well, I mean, we're seeing that. I mean, there was always potential in the Finger Lakes. We've seen stuff in the Finger Lakes. Virginia has really, because I mean, I had a, I had a Merlot Petit Verdot blend out of Virginia, which I would never, if it was a blind taste, I would never thought the wine was from Virginia. I, I mean, I hear there's this ridge of limestone and like la- on Lake Ontario that that has a ton of potential, and that's sort of a different piece of the of the question too, which is also really interesting. Which is, you know. One of the reasons the old world places we know where they where they make great wine is because they've had 400, 500 years to discuss yeah. it or longer. Yeah. You know? I mean, the monks spent four hundred years charting charting vineyards in Burgundy. We didn't do that in the U.S., no, right? No, we do, we're very very young. All of the New World. Do we really know that you know Napa and Sonoma and Santa Barbara are the best places to to grow grapes? We know it's the best places we found in the very limited time frame that we've searched. So it's really you know we're learning a lot more about that, and it's really exciting to think about what those other places might. For sure, for sure. Um, let's uh, flip gears a little bit. Um, you spent some time in Berlin, um, three years as a wine advisor, or is, is my research oh, off? Oh gosh, you know, oh, I yeah. I advised an auction house. I, I can't even remember that I did that. There was there was a wine auction company that I that, that I worked with a little bit, and, and uh, they would they would ask my help to effectively. Uh, Price out wine cellars okay. and tell them if it was worth doing. Okay, okay. It, it, it's such an asterisk on what I on okay. what I've done. I can't. It's hard for me to. I oh, wish I'd a, spent more time in Berlin. Okay, you didn't it sounds like you should have a great story. I know. Like I, was, I, was, I, was like, like, I was thinking like, did you have to wear black? Was it like now's the time we did? Like it was like sprockets or something like that. You know. Sounds like a great like, but some really small glasses, like a re- yeah. black suit, th- <laughs> thin black tie. It could be a new look for me. <laughs> oh my god. Um, <clears throat> so. We're enjoying this amazing French wine, these Burgundies. Um, 
tell us about uh, why you joined the fight against the wine tariffs and your work with the uh, U.S. Trade Wine Trade Alliance. Uh, well, initially, self-preservation, I think, was my main motivating factor. Um, you know, our business, uh, we sell, you know, the vast majority of the wine we sell is, you know, from the old world. Yeah. Um, and most of them were impacted by tariffs on wine. Um, but I remember, I, I don't have a very healthy appetite for risk. Um, I don't enjoy it. And um, I had heard, when I remember hearing rumblings about, in, you know, in 2019, about wines being potentially tariffed. And uh, I knew some people that worked in um, government that told me it was something I should take really seriously. And uh, I think around around May, uh, there was there was a hearing in May that effectively of 2019 that effectively no one from the wine business went to. Um, we basically didn't understand that this that the federal government could be a threat to us because mm-hmm. most laws that uh, impact the wine business, the, the wine industry, are state laws, right? Because mm-hmm. of the repeal of prohibition, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no overlying you know federal uh, agency that oversees you know the wine business. In every state, there is some kind of agency that o- that oversees our industry. So we never look at the federal government as being a risk. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a couple of months later, you know, I, I heard it was you know being considered. And then a couple of months later, in July, uh, I think I read in my, maybe my dad sent me a story that said Trump's considering 100 percent 100 percent tariff on all European wines. And I was like, oh my god, this is terrible. And I started reading about, uh, you know, sort of the underlying issue, which was this fight between Boeing and Airbus. And uh, I understood pretty quickly that our industry, you know, the wine industry, effectively means nothing uh, to the powers that be, especially when you're talking about Boeing. Boeing is is one of the most powerful <coughs> companies in the they U.S. They make airplanes, not just commercial exactly. airplanes. That's exactly right. Well, they're, they're also America's largest exporter. So I knew if we were getting into an argument uh, with the EU about something like this, we were, we were in trouble. Um, so I start, but, but I'm, a, I'm a wine retailer in New York City, right? This yeah. is above my pay grade. Yeah. I assume there is one big, giant wine lobbying who's he, what's it that's probably funded by Empire and Southern, and they know everybody. Shit. And they've got everybody <laughs> on a cell phone, and I'm assuming they're in Palm Beach, you know, doing something really fun and exciting. They're, they're down at mar lago yeah, working exa- it out. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. And I just sort of assumed that that's the way it worked. And so I, so I started talking with um, a lot of the people at the NAWR, the National Association of Wine Retailers, about my concerns, and then a few other people about my concerns. Uh, you know, the distributors that I knew, and look, most of the distributors I know that, you know, probably the distributors, the guys you know, right? Like, they're the fine wine world, which, you know, they're incredible successes in our world, but it's, it's, they're not the big giant, uh, na- they're not the big giant distributors, right? Right, right. Um, I mean, the wine business is small. Like, the reality is we're very small. The largest company, Southern Wine and Spirits, I think they have 22,000 employees. Amazon probably has twice that number of job openings on LinkedIn. <laughs> Just... Um, <laughs> Southern or, or breakthrough beverage is like the what like the second maybe they've got six thousand employees that's like the HR department at J P Morgan yeah we are tiny yeah tiny yep. Apple has more cash than like the GDP of France yeah um, but we assumed and I assumed all of us in this sort of world assumed well gosh there are these you know the big giant wine guys that have so much money involved they have all of the connections they have everybody on speed dial and to a degree that's true in all the states they do mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's again, that's that's who they lobby. They, the, the state governments are the ones that pass laws that oversee what we do. I think most of them are dumb, but uh, that's a different story. I but, know we'll have to have but, you back yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jeez. But the reality is, is, is that they, we have our industry has not spent almost any time cultivating uh, relationships in Washington because they don't impact us. So we had we, we had no allies, none whatsoever, um, and then. There was another hearing that went terribly for us because effectively the USTR, the U.S. Trade Representative, was asking, "Which gosh, we got this big problem with Boeing. What products should we tariff? And they gave this huge giant list of stuff. Ours was like a third of it. 
and basically nobody from the wine industry showed up. <laughs> and and ever whereas like one textile product was listed and there were like five textile people testifying about the damage <laughs> it would do to, to or, or not even just textiles, which is a huge industry, but right. like some tiny, like we make ceramic tiles that go behind your oven, you know, like something right. very specific. Right. And right. even they had like loads right. of people right. like, oh crap, this right. is terrible. But we had nobody. Um, and so sure enough, my, uh, I, I talked to a couple of friends that, you know, were working in government at the time. Um, and, and I wanted to really know how serious is this? And it became more and more clear between, you know, August and September that this was going to happen. And uh, in the beginning, the first thing I was told is it is almost certainly going to be 100%. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looked like it was going to be – Airbus is mainly in France, but, you know, it's a French company, but uh, they also do business in Germany and in the U.K. and in Spain. Um, you know, it's the most important business for the EU. It's the, the EU's largest exp uh, ex – it's the largest – company in the EU that exports products, I believe. But what I was hearing was going to be 100% on wines from France. Mm -hmm. And that's, you, it, like, it's pick up and go home day, yeah, right? That, that was going to be a wrap. Percent, <laughs> that's a wrap. You're done. I, I mean, Your $10 what? cheap Bordeaux is now $20. Um, like, I mean, oh, exactly I mean, right. I mean it's, it's a wrap uh, at uh, that point. Oh, exactly. And look, we had done a lot of business overseas. We do a lot of business overseas. And, and we I'd taken a trip to Hong Kong thinking, um, you know, this might be a really great or, or look, this is another avenue for us potentially, and it, it's it's a great uh, wine community there, mm -hmm, and we've mm -hmm. done business there, uh, and you know I, I've been there before, but you know one of our you know great employees is you know came from another business, you know Lauren McFay came from a business in Hong Kong, but uh, <laughs> it was October, of tw it was like October of 2019 or November of 2019 when I went to Hong Kong, and by so. Hong Kong was in flux because of the battle with, Ch effectively, you know, the protests and the battle with China. And then COVID happened, what was going to happen right after. Um, but they enacted 25%. So I was, I was one of the only people that was thrilled when I heard it was 25% on wines, you know, under, you know, 14% or under. Um, but it was still devastating. And I thought pretty quickly, um, there are loads of people and loads of businesses in the U.S. at the time that were impacted negatively by tariffs. And if we didn't do something about it, uh, no one else was going to fight our battle for us. Mm -hmm. It was almost a zero-sum game, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. if, uh, if we get our tariffs taken off, they were going to tariff something else. You know, there, there was a little bit of that. So um, it was clear we needed, to, we, needed, we needed to tell Congress why this was a bad idea. Because it sounds really easy, right? It's like, well, look, the only people you're hurting are French businesses or, or, or businesses in Germany and the UK. Um, but because of the weird way the wine business works in the US, because of this three-tier system that we have, you actually do more economic damage to US businesses than to businesses overseas when you tariff mm -hmm. wine. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, effectively, the opportunity cost of all, uh, you know, here in the United States you do like a dollar forty damage to American businesses, most of which are, by the way, small, family-owned right, businesses. Right, right, right. For every dollar of harm we inflict on businesses in the European Union, so that makes wine a terribly ineffective way to convince the EU to come to an agreement about, you know, the large civil aircraft matter or anything else. They know we're doing more harm to us than we are to them, mm -hmm. but the U.S. didn't know that. Right. Uh, the, you know, the USTR, the U.S. Trade Representative, didn't understand the way the three-tier system worked. Nobody in Congress did. Um, and so the U.S. Wine Trade Alliance was started uh, with, you know, a lot of the, the very best importers and distributors and uh, fine wine retailers and restaurants. And, you know, we were working on it. And, you know, we, we'd been working hard on this issue. And there's, you know, a great team of people. And I think Harmon and Jeff Zachariah actually asked me if I would, because I'd been working on tariffs for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'd been spending a lot of time on it because I realized that the magical empire and Southern people weren't doing anything effectively. Right. Right. Um, I, I, as, as a matter of fact, I called many times and asked, "What are you doing?" And they, and they said, "There's really nothing you can do." And <laughs> they're like, "We're selling this vodka." And, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. They're like, "Would you like some peanut butter?" Whiskey? Exactly. And I'm like, "We're no. selling tequila. Um, we're, we're good. Man. We're good, yeah, bro. We're good, baby." <laughs> um, no, I don't want any peanut, peanut butter whiskey. I'm fine. Um, <laughs> Meanwhile, the, you know, some of the people that I knew in D.C., and my wife had actually, um, she had worked f in D.C. After, right after college, mm -hmm. um, and so she, she put me in touch with a couple of other people as well who worked in, you know, think tanks or, you know, just had that experience. It's a like, crazy world. Like, people don't, people, like you, 
people don't understand the way government works. Like think tanks exactly right. and and position papers and like like I went to law school, so I have some understanding. But people don't understand how this shit works, man. Like you said, like lobbying groups. Like you're like we, you guys know they had no lobby. You had no. Why would you be in D.C.? And I mean, what you said makes sense. There was there's no federal regulation of alcohol, but for you know ATF, but but for but you know. So it, it would make no sense for there to be an association. And then, like you said, but everybody else has got an association is in D.C. You know, the Italian Tile Association was there. That's exactly right. You know, they were there making sure that, they, you know. Like, the Cruze and Staub people, man. <laughs> exactly right. I mean, they were telling the government the devastation. Like, literally, I listened to the head of, you know, the former president of Cruze. Mm -hmm. I, I love Cruze. Great company. Yep. Talk about the devastation that would come to this rural area of South Carolina if they uh, in implemented tariffs on their products, because France was the only place that could make uh, the material that you know that Cruzes from. Um, and sure enough, there was n they put no tariff on those. Products. <laughs> um, and meanwhile, we had you know we had nobody doing anything essentially. But but um, the people who buy Cruze drink French wine. They do exactly. And then <laughs> look after the tariffs went into effect. Everything, you know, the world changed in the wine world. Everybody understood how mm -hmm. incredibly devastating this was. And I have to say, like, one of the coolest experiences was there was, uh, you, you know, there was actually a, another tariff that, that we we actually helped convince them not to put in. And it was a tariff on all uh, sparkling wine from France. So champagne. So they had threatened and proposed a 100% tariff on all sparkling wine from France. And this was... Uh, you know, they announced it in December of 2019, you know, so after they put the still wine tariff in. So at that point, the wine industry knew. All these people knew in, in the wine industry. Oh, holy crap. The government can do this. They give us a venue t for us to tell them why they shouldn't. We should probably take advantage of that. And there was a hearing in January. I think it was January 7th of 2020. And uh, I knew that we were going, The I was speaking with some people from the National Association of Wine Retailers, and so I knew Jeff Zachariah and I were going to testify there. And then I saw there were a couple of really great uh, wine distributors. I knew David Bowler was going to testify, um, David Waldenberg from BNP, who represents the New York Fine Wine Alliance, which is a lot of, you know, sort of the your favorite wine distributors, right? Like, um, you know, the Skernicks and the Bowlers and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't just those guys. There were, I think there were over 20 wine small family-owned wine businesses that testified, which was absolutely incredible. And I think at least two-thirds, if not three-fourths of the entire hearing were uh, small business owners from the wine community telling the USTR how devastating these tariffs would be to U.S. businesses. And that was incredibly powerful. And that just sort of happened organically. Um, you know, we didn't have, there was no mailing list with mm -hmm. everybody's name on it at that point. Uh, you know, ev everybody sort of knew each other and the word got out, but it wasn't organized. Um, and it was really absolutely, uh, absolutely incredible. And it made a huge impact. And afterwards, we, we, we thought, you know, we needed to get organized. And, uh, you know, the, U the USWTA, the, you know, the U.S. Wine Trade Alliance, you know, formed and then started doing you know, sort of the block and tackle lobbying and advocacy work that is really critical if uh, you want to have any influence on what the U.S. government does. Yeah, I, I think I, I found it interesting um, that uh, they were doing, they were going to do so much damage to small businesses, right? And we talk about the American spirit. We talk about, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, are the grid of America, but like literally, you have this huge corporation, huge, huge, huge. We're a capitalist country, going to the government for help, and would would have just obliterated so many businesses, just for their own. Well, and you know, what's profit. I mean, like, I mean, I mean, literally, like, it's okay because we have shareholders. It's okay if we put all these people out of business as long as we turn a profit this quarter. And and the government was going to allow that. that that's just so. Th the, the, what's the word when, not just but just the, it's it's almost it's uh, the hip the hypocrisy of it. Well, you know, it's it's funny the. Um, it's really unusual to tariff, products that have no similarity, right? Yep. So typically the way it would have worked is, all right, we think the EU did this bad thing with Airbus that was bad for Boeing, and Boeing's really important for us. All right, so we're going to tariff Airbus products. Right. 
But guess what? Wine people didn't have any allies in Congress, but you know who did? Airbus. Yeah. Airbus is a French company, yep. and they had more U.S. Congress people speaking up for in them their pocket. than American <laughs> businesses did. Now, the, the good thing was, you know, even even Boeing wasn't happy with it, right? right. Because they ended up putting a 25% tariff on wines, and Boeing's like, well, what the crap do we care about wines? And they only put a 15% tariff on, or actually in the beginning, it was only 10% on, on Airbus itself. So even even Boeing was like, what are you guys doing? Yeah, that's but, crazy. But, you know, Richard Shelby was a powerful senator in Alabama. Airbus has a, gives him a ton of money. There's an Airbus facility in Alabama. Um, I'm not saying there was any involvement there, but it's true. It is a story. Uh, Airbus is one of the most powerful company, companies in the EU, but also in the United States. And it's just a fact. Mm. So the fact that they were sort of the cause of the problem or illegal subsidies were, to Airbus were the cause of the problem – and they weren't the people that were, mo- that were that felt the brunt of the punishment was really frustrating for us. Um, but it was a story not many people knew. But the good news was we found that you know people on both sides of the aisle really quickly got up to speed and said, "Wow, mm-hmm. this is ridiculous." Uh, I mean, there are you know forty seven thousand small you know wine retailers in the U.S. We're something like we average like six employees a person, a wine retailer in the United States. Mm-hmm. The laws that go around how the USTR is supposed to implement a tariff are, are, su- are supposed to specifically take into consideration damage to small and medium-sized businesses. And they completely ignored it at the time. They, you're supposed to put tariffs on, you know, there's an understanding that large, massive companies have a, more of a capacity to absorb that damage than small or medium-sized businesses. So you're mm-hmm. supposed to take that in consideration. Mm-hmm. They completely ignored it, put much larger tariffs on products that impacted us than they did on Airbus itself, which is both massive and at fault. Um, but we were able to get, you know, huge numbers of uh, from both sides of the aisle to, to help our cause. You know, we had more than 165 members of the House representatives, both sides of the aisle, write the USTR, say, please, saying, please, and these and the tariffs on all of these wine products. We had 13 senators, which is really difficult to get, write a letter to the USTR saying, this does incredible damage to US businesses. You've got to undo this. Um, and you know, knock on wood, uh, you know, we also, by the way, had record-breaking uh, outreach to the USTR themselves. The USTR puts, puts out a, a public comment period for any proposed tariffs, right? And usually they'll get two or 300 comments, maybe six or 900. Uh, the first time we did it, we had, I think, 27,000 comments specifically against tariffs on wine. And then the, the last round, the last open comment period, we had more than 30,000 comments. They actually had to develop an entirely new website to accept comments from the public because of the extraordinary response from the wine industry. I mean, that is incredible. I mean, it is absolutely stunning. One of the members of the USTR actually called me at one point and said, look, just our email is public. You know, I'm a public servant. I, I and by the way, like the block and tackle staff at USTR are not to blame, right? Mm-hmm. I, I do mm-hmm. think at the time there were, you know, there were some issues with some of the political appointees at USTR that made some really bad decisions. And once once you make a bad decision, they didn't want to own it, right? Right. If they if the USTR at the time in 2020, Robert Lighthizer had reversed course, it would have been it would have signaled an error and a failure. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to do that. But some of the the block and tackle staff who really do care about the damage that they may do, you know, a, a couple of them wrote me and were like, look, you know, we're public servants. We would never tell the public not to email us about their concerns. Just, you know, if, if you have a couple of distributors or importers that want to write me, that's okay. But p- please, please don't tell everybody to email me. <laughs> please go through the public comment. Please don't. I, we, they're like, we know 10,000 people will write us yep. if you guys ask. Yep. Please, please go through this other thing so we, so we don't f- get our in- inboxes flooded. But... Um, thankfully, you know, we ha- had a large number of allies, both sides of the aisle. A new USTR, um, Catherine Tai, was put in place um, by the Biden administration. And luckily, Catherine Tai, we actually knew. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a, an early meeting with Catherine Tai in January of 2020 because mm-hmm. she was actually the chief um, sort of trade counsel for the chairman of Ways and Means. Okay. Uh, so she was already experienced, already knew the, knew the issue, mm-hmm. um, totally up to date. And, you know, at this time, you know, they put a pause on the tariffs, a four-month pause on the tariffs to, to let the, – they understood what the damage was, was happening. So even though they haven't totally resolved the Airbus-Boeing issue, um, it's an incredibly complicated case. It's been going on, you know, since the Bush administration, right? So – it, it was. It's going to take a while f- for them to, you know, dot all of the I's, cross all of the T's. 
Um, but they understood the economic impact that this was happening, or that 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 was happening here, and uh, so they put they've right now they put a pause for about four months, and we're hopeful that they're going to be able to fully resolve this, and hopefully understand that wine is a, an incredibly ineffective product to tariff. And you do more damage to U.S. businesses, mostly small family-owned businesses, than businesses overseas. So, how did uh, Tribeca wine merchants? Um, survived this storm. You had tariffs and then COVID hit. So how were you well, affected yeah, by the COVID uh, pandemic? I mean, oh, boy, what a year, man. <laughs> oh, fuck. I, and I have to say, like, how amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm vaccinated. I'm sure you yeah. guys are vaccinated. Yep. It, it, it feels incredible to be able to, you know, I get back to the community bit, right? Yeah. That's the hardest Sit thing. Sit down and drink wine with people. And, uh, Break again. bread, yep. share a bottle of wine without without fear. And, and not just the fear that you were going to get sick. I had, I had COVID, and it was no fun at all. Um, but it was really the fear that you might get someone else sick. That right. was terrifying. Well, at least for me. You know what absolutely. I mean? I don't want to get anybody sick. You no, know? exactly. It was uh, absolutely terrifying. You know. Um, so it just feels so great to be able to, you know, share, share, and I'm just starting, we're just sort of starting doing this again. My, my wife and I were really careful. We had very limited con, you know, very limited meals or contacts with, you know, outside of our little pod. Mm -hmm. Um, so it feels pretty amazing. You know, it's such a luxury to be able to go outside, meet a couple of friends, open a bottle of wine. It's, it's incredible. And, you know, give somebody a hug. I know. know it, it, like. I know. It feels amazing. I remember my first trip to California. First time on a plane. Second time on a plane. Um, back in... Ever or just... April. Yeah, no. Yeah, no I've been on a kidding. plane once or twice. Um, <laughs> uh, we're not going to talk about that. It was just something, you know, it was CIA. No, I'm just kidding, guys. Um, but, uh, like, literally met someone new, and they were like, I'm vaccinated. They're like, can I give you a hug? They're like... I, w I haven't hugged a stranger in a year and a half. Like, like, oh, yeah. I mean, like, and I was like, oh, my God, it's so true. You know, like, you used to just shake someone's hand, you know, you like, you know, and I'm a, hu I'm a hugger, so I give people a hug. And it was like, uh, you know, you give them the elbow or just, you know. Um, but, yeah, did did COVID-19, did it affect your business uh, at all? Because, you, you know what I mean, uh, you, you live in a, you have a sure. neighborhood-type store, so people were probably used to coming in. And, right. And, 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 and. and just um, being with you guys, you know, uh, if you had a told, if you had told me what was going to happen and how we would have had to respond, or if, if you'd told me, for instance, that Tribeca, where we're located, would effectively poof flee, right? I don't know if there's a neighborhood that had more people leave than than Tribeca did. Um, I don't know what I would have said. Uh, it concern would have been <laughs> would have been present but in the in the context of I think the overall devastation in our community particularly for restaurants um, it's really hard for me to you know th this was a challenging time but I just have to be thankful as a business mm -hmm. you know we were fine we didn't have to let any employees go during the pandemic uh, you know we were able to keep everybody everybody's hours up um, Every, things changed a lot, right? Um, I mean, Tribeca basically had no one in it for quite some time, mm. you know, basically a year. Um, it's still slowly coming back. But, you know, the most of our business is always, you know, is done through email and website and things like that. So, you know, the wine market was actually doing well. Um, yeah, because people were drinking more. People were drinking, uh, exactly right. It's not so clear-cut the way, you know, I've, I've heard some people talk about how, like, all retailers are doing amazing and, uh, and, it's, and it's the best part of the world. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, there are loads of small wine retailers. You know, I, I work with, I, I'm on the board of the National Association of Wine Retailers, and there are a lot of wine retailers that did terribly. I mean, you could imagine, and it, and it was so sad, you, you could imagine, right, if you have a small, uh, small wine shop in downtown Cleveland, right, and you're next to two giant office buildings, Mm -hmm. And that was your business, yep. you know, and you had that business for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, all of the lawyers, all of the office, uh, office people that work there, well, they're not coming to work anymore because the office buildings are going to be shut down for a year. There's, they may be buying a lot of wine, but they were buying it from wine.com or they, they, were wine, buy, they, were, they were buying it from somebody else. They weren't buying it from that small mm -hmm. local person. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are lots of retailers, like if, if you were in a place that usually only if you're in the Berkshires right and usually people only live there three months a year well now they were there 12 months a year so you did great right um, 
But for us, it, it was fine. It was really difficult for us to see, you know, something that, you know, the hardship in Tribeca and the real, but if, if you're, if you made it to the other side, I think you just have to think you're blessed. And, and seeing the devastation in the restaurant industry was just terrifying. I mean, I mean that was just so sad. Uh, I remember I had, a, you know, a friend of mine call me um, who was a sommelier, and he was starting a, an advocacy organization for sommeliers to try to, you know, find some way to fund so many of these people that, that were out of work. Mm -hmm. And I remember he was, you know, wanting to talk to me about it. And um, he said at one point, you know, because all of the sommeliers have been fired. And it's sort of a startling comment. But, you know, there was basically a day where almost every hospitality person in the country lost their job. Uh, that's, it's hard to fathom, right? I, I mean, what event could you see precipitating something like that? Uh, uh, it's not something I, I could have I, ever I mean, we, we have Wall Street crashes and nobody loses their fucking job. They get bonuses. Or, or they, they get some huge, of them do, but yeah, some of them make but, a ton of money. Exactly, oh, exactly, exactly right. right. You know what I mean? Like, but like, like wholesale, no, like exactly right. Just like, people losing their job. You're all gone. I know it's it's awful. And and even when restaurants started to open back up, uh, and that's one of the con real concerns I have is you know so many restaurants have learned. Well, look, they started doing business again now without wine staff, without profession and professional knowledgeable wine staff. Right. You get used to that. Right. I think we all knew. We were in this incredible, like New York City, but in the U.S. in general, but New York City was in this cr incredible what, golden era of restaurants and end of wine. I, I mean, it went, you know, there was a time frame. Roger, Roger de Gorn, this legendary sommelier, he was at a, a famous old Tribeca restaurant called Chanterelle. Um, and I remember him telling me, uh, and he's an MS, uh, but like one of the original guys. But I remember him telling me at one point, like, New York City had, like, five restaurants with Psalms. Mm -hmm. Like, there, yep. there were, like, five restaurants. Yep. If you wanted to learn, yep. you would go be, a, you know, you'd, you'd go be a busboy at one of those restaurants, yep. talk to the Psalm. He'd come back and pour you. He's like, well, this is what a corked bottle of Lynch Bosch smells like. You should not serve this bottle. Um, but now it, we, we got to – there was this golden era where, you know, any restaurant in, in an outer lying part of Brooklyn or Queens needed to have, like – they had to have, they have a wine director. They had a you know three floor slums. It's a, a, every single restaurant if, it, it seemed needed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. professional wine staff, mm -hmm. and that that felt. I don't know that that how long it will take for that to come back. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, restaurant tours put a lot of money or a, 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 mu a much higher percentage of their revenue into paying professional wine people and, and into the wines themselves than they had previously. Yes, and. Yes. Um, that quickly became, you know, as restaurants came back, that was the first thing that they said, well, well, this isn't happening, right? You know, we can't, we simply, the economics don't work that way right now. And I, I don't know what the time frame for the economics to start working like that will come. I don't know when that's going to be again. Uh, I mean, we were in this golden era of restaurants and the pandemic just sort of cleaned house. And um, thank God they're starting to come back. But I, I don't know how long it will, uh, that's a real question, I think, of when things are going to come back if they come back the way they did. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a good and bad, right? I, I mean, like, on the one hand, it was great to see all of our friends, like, do so well and there'd be so many jobs, like, in our, in our industry. It's amazing. Right. On the other hand, if you're, you know, like, my generation and a little younger, like, all the financial people would say, this generation spends way too much money, made way too large a percentage of their paycheck on food and drink. Right. They, you really shouldn't be going out to dinner five nights a week. Right, right, right. <laughs> but right. so, and look, the pandemic taught a lot of people how not to go out to dinner five nights a week mm -hmm. or three nights a week. Mm -hmm. And here's how you make the preacher's lentil stew. It's delicious. <laughs> you should try it. Here's your sourdough <laughs> it costs starter. Four dollars. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, for, you get your own sourdough starter, and you can make your sourdough starter. And you can make bread for. Three months for what that one loaf cost you at the artisanal bakery. You know what I mean? That, like, that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, boy, my I tell you what, my wife and I, um, she got into baking like I'm sure. Oh, new story, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, she she was doing two cakes a week for a little while. That was kind of rough for me. Oh uh, uh, well, my really wife, delicious. my wife, but, my wife always, has always baked. She had her own baking business, so it's always been a challenge for me. Like people go, I don't know how you don't weigh three hundred pounds. I'm like, cause I make her give it away. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say there's only one answer there. Yeah. It's like you have nothing to do with it whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, it's kind yeah. of Boolean, I yeah, think. Yeah. You either 
partake or you do not. Yep. There's no middle ground. Nope, 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 nope. So as things are opening up, what excites you? Uh, what excites you most about? Uh, the wine business and and the work you're doing uh, moving forward. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing friends and family again. I think, I, you know, that's the easy one. Everybody is. Uh, I think it one of the one of the great things about both sort of the tariff situation and the pandemic is, I think a, a lot of our businesses that we sort of kept to ourselves, and we all knew each other, but we didn't really speak. We mm-hmm. didn't really talk. People were quasi competitors or. Or even even if you weren't a competitor, you were just you know with distributors. There was sort of a uh, I'm kind of looking you know we're allies, but yeah. I know you're trying yeah, exactly. to be it's a like... little bit skeptical. But um, and I think we all sort of understood that this is this is a challenge we all need to get through together. Yeah. And our industry works much better when we work together. You know that, that's something I think like Robert Mondavi actually said really brilliantly. You know, um, he was not you know. Obviously, famous guy from Napa, but he was not a part of the Paris tasting. Right. And if there, even though he was making famous wines, he was making, or well, not quite famous at the time, but in Napa, he was the big, probably the biggest yeah, figure the guy. in Napa. He was yeah. the guy. Um, he was making great wine. He wasn't a part of the tasting. And now all these these other guys are are getting lauded all over. He could have tried to stamp that out. He could have been like, you know, the Paris tasting really didn't mean that much. I'm still the guy. If it was done well, I would have been involved. Um, it means nothing because they didn't have me involved. But he didn't. He w- he understood that California and Napa being on the map. When everybody gets, when everybody has success in Napa, he's going to be ha- have success in uh, himself. And that you know his neighbor's success, success you know, w- w- it was going to it was going to help his own business. Um, and he understood the community of the wine business and how they could all grow and function together and. I think that's something that we are that we've we've had a lot more of that in the last year than I think we ever have, which is which is terrific. Yeah, super cool, super cool. Well, Ben, oh my God, <clears throat> Ben, thank you so much for coming. I just love you have this just wonderful way about you, just extremely um, a fountain of knowledge and uh, and a very humble, um, but uh, just great conversations, great stories. Uh, and you know, thank you so much for all the hard work you done. I mean, you did a lot for the, our whole industry. So, no, thank well, you. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I really appreciate it. And yeah. man, I'm so thrilled that Josh Reynolds uh, t- told you to reach out. And yeah. Josh is just the, the just a sweetheart and one of the most knowledgeable guys yeah. on the planet. I, he's. I mean, I've had a few conversations with him, and, and I got to get him on here. But like, literally, you could go uh, mating habits of Tibetan llamas, and he'll he could talk for an hour. He's like. like he, what, which, which genus is well, species? Well, exactly, right? <laughs> Come on, dude. Um, so, um, Ben, please tell everybody um, where they can find you, how they can be a part of the things you're doing. You know, give you some of your social handles, Tribeca Wine. Where can they find you? You know, we're on Instagram at Tribeca Wine. You can please take a look at our website, TribecaWine.com. Sign up for our emails. That's really the best way to see and hear what we're doing. Uh, we love writing about wine and sharing what, sharing what our thoughts are. And we'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. Oh, my God. What a guest today. Uh, Ben Aniff, thank you for being here. Until next time, everybody, uh, here's to the mavericks, the philosophers, the deep thinkers, the lobbyists uh, (laughs) who keep us all in the wine and all you wine drinkers. Peace.